I'm, I've de- I think this is probably the other like truism of surf culture is like your best waves are never seen by right. anyone. Right. It's like everyone sees you cooking out, yeah. like, and we all cook out like from you know. Um. Hello and welcome to the UK Surf Show. I am your host Pete, and on today's episode, I headed up to Bristol and had a chat with Jeremy Loops. Jeremy Loops is a singer songwriter from South Africa and also a very good surfer did this one on my own and if you've seen our social media you'll know why but i'll talk more about that at the end of the show uh yeah a bit weird doing it on my own for the first time um kind of uh know how deck felt when ant went into rehab now but um yeah it was a strange one it's um you know i think i started off a bit nervous but i hope it's all right and uh i'm sure you'll let me know either way if it was or wasn't uh yeah so i went up to bristol met jeremy loops in his hotel sat in the room with uh becky from decca records and uh jeremy interviewing him and uh yeah i think it went all right before we get into this episode don't forget to head over to northcore and use the discount code ss podcast 15 and that will get you 15 percent off anything you order from northcore and that is valid until the 30th of september also head across to surface wetsuits that's s-r-f-a-c-e and get 10 percent off anything from surface wetsuits and use the discount code the uk surf show 10 all capitals all one word and that will get you 10 percent off surface wetsuits so yeah here it goes with jeremy loops yo hello 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 my name is jeremy loops and i'm a musician coming from cape town south africa and i've just landed here in the uk made my way to bristol (laughs) <laughs> yeah so if we go back to like the start from your your start in music surfing you know where you grew up mm. and i have looked up the name of the place you grew up but there's no way go on go on right? what do you got no, it, was, it, was, it begins with a k i know that okay that's called comicky comicky that's yeah. it okay so yeah growing up what sort of like were you surfing straight away or yeah, more or less. Yeah, I moved to the little, uh, it's a very rural, um, at, at least it was when I grew up. It's quite a rural little town. Not dissimilar from what you'd imagine like a little town like Polzeth in Cornwall yeah. to be, you know, like just a few thousand people, not too many houses. And um, I suppose the difference would be that we have like world class waves there. So it's a very, um, the, the surf spot at my home beach is a beach called Long Beach. And we've got a very, solid barreling uh, beach break down the way called dunes and that's a world-class wave that people come and surf and seek out and so my parents didn't move there because of the surf they were just trying to move out of the city my mother's from switzerland my father's from johannesburg so neither of them were actually from cape town yeah and they i think they got married in Cormacie. they you know they came they were traveling around cape town and found this little town at the very tip of Cape Town, like right down by the nature reserve, by Cape Point, which is literally, if you imagine the two oceans coming together at the bottom of South Africa, yeah. right at the tip, that's Cape Point. So I grew up maybe 15 minutes away from there, which is where Komiki is. And we have just yeah, a whole bunch of world-class waves in an hour radius around there, maybe like upwards of 30 to 40 different breaks that you could be surfing. Wow. So people come from all over the world to surf down there. And if you grow up in Komiki or one of the small towns around it, it's likely that by the age of 10, you are embedded in the surf culture already. So I think I started at maybe seven years old yeah, and grew up there, went to a little primary school where we used to go down to the beach for break time and uh, PT on the beach. So yeah. it was a very barefooted uh, Dogtown and the Z Boys type of existence, nice. South African yeah. style. <laughs> I've seen you speak about something before and saying skateboarding as well. So did you skateboard at the at the time there as well? Yeah, for it? sure, exactly. It was like uh, skateboarding was becoming a cool thing to do, and the, the streets of our town had just recently been tarred when I was like a kid. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of gravel roads in the town when we were growing up, and yeah. like slowly they would get tarred. And then when there was a new gravel, a new tarred road, we would all froth out and go and like <laughs> s- skate around there. And roller hockey was a thing at one stage and kids were playing roller hockey in the streets. But yeah, surfing was always the main thing. And I think South Africa or Cape Town was one of the early kind of adopters of surfing. So there was always quite a cool surf culture bustling under and like um, some of the early surf shops starting out and yeah. stuff like that so uh, yeah it's it was all we ever knew growing up and uh, I only really understood the city life when I got to high school and went to university and started moving away from there yeah 
yeah. So, like, from from growing up surfing, what can you remember what your first board was and how how it started? For sure, yeah. No, I, um, surfboards were, were like this pretty expensive thing when you were a kid, hey, like, and your first board was quite a big deal. My first board was a safari, um, which was made by a famous shaper called Spider Murphy, yeah. who is from Durban, and he still still shapes to this day. His boards are still world-renowned. Um, but he was well known back in the in the eighties, specifically for kind of some of the first performance short boards that were, you know, popular in South yeah. Africa at least amongst some of our our famous riders back then. So, yeah, I think my first board was like a very banged up old oversized safari. Yeah, it's good to learn it on. And then, so what about music? When did music start to play a part in your life? Was that at the same time or no, no, no? Much later. I was a late bloomer with music. I did just about everything else um, under the sun before finding music at the age of 21. Wow. I studied at university. I went and studied like a business degree after taking, yeah, I took two years off after high school. So I finished high school a year early at just um, when I was like 17 and a half. So I had a bit of time to kill and I decided to go traveling and I did some sailing and I did some of my sailing courses. I thought like what better way to go and see the world by getting on a boat i also didn't have much money i couldn't afford to just like my parents couldn't fly me all around the world on my gap year so i was like screw it i'm gonna get myself over there so i remember i found it the other day i've still got it i I drew this little flyer up with a picture of me like 17 year old jeremy and um, a little write-up which said uh you know got my got my day skipper sailing course under the belt and i'm willing to uh, i'm looking for a trip overseas um i didn't like state where overseas it was like open-ended and willing to work for 50 rand a day which is like the equivalent of two pounds a day (laughs) um it was which is low for south african standards as well i was like really trying to make myself as as employable as possible and i think it was maybe three or four weeks later i got a call from a captain who was leaving on a little 40 foot um sailboat and he was leaving Cape Town, heading for the Caribbean. Wow. And much to my parents' dismay, because I think they were like, you can't do your first trip like all the way there. And I was, oh, I was like, I have to go. This is my, this is my ticket over. Yeah. And so I j- jumped on this little boat and it took 56 days before we hit land, um, which was a wild, wild way to get into yeah, traveling. That's, yeah, that's baptism by fire, isn't it? Yeah. Like, that's, I suppose you don't think about that when you get on it, first of all, on 56 days, I cannot get off this thing. Yeah, it was it was crazy. I mean, I, I remember this was also like, I mean, uh, this was some time ago, so it was it was before the days of like having an iPhone with a playlist on. I still had like uh, a mini disc player, yeah. you know, <laughs> and like a few mini discs. I remember I had like a Most Def and Talib Kweli CD and I had a like Toots and the Matals reggae CD and maybe I had like a Paul Simon and Lady Smith Black Mombazo CD. It was literally just three or four <laughs> <laughs> albums, <laughs> which was like wildly unprepared. Like yeah, if I, if I look back and then, uh, yeah, I think in those 56 days, I remember I kept like a dream journal. I journaled every day and I read 14 books because you have so much time um, when there were, there were just three of us on the boat, the captain, myself, and one other deckhand. Wow. And you just do these, you do your rotation at night. So you have, I was on rotation every night from uh, 12 o'clock till three in the morning. That was my like midnight shift. And you're all on your own, like in the middle of the ocean, in the dark, just quietly sailing, like slowly through, uh, yeah, through the middle of nowhere, really. And uh, it was beautiful, though. It was a really, really exciting. I remember I turned 18 while I was out there. Yeah. And um, I arrived in the Caribbean and started hustling and looking for work. And I think I worked around the Caribbean for a couple of months, uh, really just sleeping in people's hammocks. And it's a it's a pretty fun place to be 18 and footloose. And um, I think I got a call a couple of months into those travels. I found my way over to the States and I was working like on some boats there in the States. And some friends of mine from West, uh, from South Africa had landed up in Cornwall yeah. uh, in Polzeth. And they phoned me and they were like, dude, you need to come over to Polzeth for, for a while. This place is really cool. It's just like home. Like you won't believe it. There's people, they surf here. There's like surf shops. There's like surf culture. Like we, we, we're working down at the surf shop. We even spoke to the bar, the, like the bar up the road. They said they'll give you a job behind the bar. And I was like, I'm definitely not leaving like the Caribbean and just to kind of, you know, like sailing around here to come over to the UK. And they were like, no, no, like scrap everything you've heard about. Like, this is not the, just the UK. This is, it's different down here. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let me, let me, let me see. And so I went down there and sure enough, it was like, 
some of the most fun we'd ever had. Uh, we stayed in a campsite. We lived in like caravans and yeah. Yeah, the, the surf culture down there was actually very similar to like what we knew and we had no idea this was happening in the UK as young South Africans. We just thought it was a place, a mud island with zero waves and zero, yeah. zero like uh, possibility down those lanes. But we were so wrong and had a great summer. So yeah, music only came way after all of that. I, I traveled, I went to university for four years, did a business degree. And that's when I kind of went a little bit crazy trying to do finance and accounting and stuff that I was so bad at that I, I found guitar. Yeah. I found YouTube and I just started doing tutorials and playing and became obsessed. It's funny how many creative people try and do something before they then scrap that and go, right, actually back to back to my sort of roots of what yeah. this is what I feel. And, you know, that, that sort of, I don't know how to say it really, but that sort of thing, they, you know, you think you've got to do this because you've got to fit in with society and you've got to be this. And I think a lot of people involved in surfing have that mm. that sort of creativeness in them or mm, that sort mm. of free free flowing thing i got loads of friends who are have had a similar you know i think a good friend of mine put it really well he's a writer and he's also be, he was a pro surfer in south africa he's now um he's now a writer but he went he was one of those like my young prodigy friends who was sponsored by all the sponsors by the time he was 16 this kid brett shearer and he wrote this piece not so long ago where he referred to, he was like, um, he was kind of speaking to the, the arrogance that is widely known in the surf or that people, I think, judge surfers by, like yeah. how some like young surfers can be quite like arrogant and they think they're really cool. And why do surfers look down on other like kind of cultures or yeah. think they're better than or whatever? And he was ref- kind of referring to that. And he just said, like, what do you expect when like as young, young kids, you go out and you start wrangling like little ocean cowboys these big like wild waves and yeah. putting yourself in like death defying situations which is certainly what we were doing down in the cape like we have some gnarly waves there and i remember just being my childhood being full of like adrenaline and fear and it gives you quite a, a quite a lot of confidence i think just to like feel safer in the world which yeah. other people that don't do those sorts of wild sports maybe don't get and um, I think that lends itself to what you're saying. Like it gives you a confidence and a creative way about you when you are putting yourself in nature in kind of crazy situations. And I think that translates quite well into other fields. And yeah, yeah, it cross, uh, you know, crosses them all. I think I saw a um, Rodney Mullin. He was doing a TED talk. I think you can see on YouTube, and he was saying that, like skateboarder how skateboarders like fall and they get back up and fall mm, and get mm. back up and it's that similar sort of thing with surfing although it doesn't hurt as much fall it, well it can do actually sometimes can do for sure <laughs> yeah but yeah skateboarding is a much more uh, yeah, yeah. I, you know I've, I've had a few where uh, you hit the water so hard you like you have to check your face to make sure like it's still there and everything but yeah they, they all seem to cross cross over and then as you say you ditched that degree and then started doing music and how did that you know, you don't wake up one day and go, right, I'm going to do music and that's it. How did that path come along? Yeah, I think so. What happened is I was struggling through this degree and I, I was pretty stubborn as well because in South Africa, we don't have the opportunities are limited for young South Africans. And I think like globally feels like the golden age of being able to study and do a degree and get a job is kind of over yeah. and everyone has to work a little bit harder and a little bit smarter to find a career and find a niche but that same problem is like really exacerbated in a place like South Africa where the possibilities are less and the downside if you don't make it is more like yeah you can get into a lot of difficulty uh living in South Africa if you because there's just no support no government support like no subsidies and it's a uh, it's tough and so I think that fear of like needing to make something of yourself was kind of what forced me down this lane of doing business but then I was so bad at it and I was such a creative kid at my heart that um I stubbornly stayed in this degree grinding my way through subjects like economics and law and um and then that's why I just I just couldn't stop playing I picked up a guitar and I got obsessed with it and it became like my my outlet and I didn't have time for a lot of surfing yeah. so I was like studying and in between studying I was just playing I was even at one stage taking my guitar to university and in between lectures just going and sitting yeah. near my car where I was parked and like playing on the side of the road basically 
um, wherever I could play. I remember I strapped, you know, those CD straps by your um, head and where yeah, you could like... like sun visors. Do you remember those yeah, yeah. sun visor CD yeah. things? I, I retrofitted mine with harmonicas when I started playing harmonica. Yeah. And I would flip it down and I had like all the keys and then I would like beatbox harmonica and play and learn along to whatever was playing on the radio or whatever CDs I was playing. So I was kind of finding clever ways to get music into my degree in whatever way I could. And by the end, um, I finished my degree. I wrote my thesis and everything. I really stuck it out stubbornly. And uh, by the time I was done, I just was so relieved that I had this piece of paper that I thought like now at least I can walk into some sort of career if everything else yeah. falls to, <laughs> falls to shit so yeah off i went into um into music and i didn't really know what i was doing i wasn't singing yet i was really just looping uh, i became obsessed with looping i had this loop pedal i was doing w- watching a lot of the early looping and loop artists on youtube of which there were only like two or three yeah. out there i was following this guy called andrew bird who's this incredible like uh, violin looper from america he's still going strong today and um yeah, I just became obsessed. And so I started busking. That's how it started. I would go to markets and just take my loop pedal and my guitar and my harmonicas and loop things up and free flow and invite people to come and listen. Or sometimes people would come and collaborate and I would loop people in. And that's actually how it all started because I met my rapper like that, my the guy who still raps in the band, Matteo Moleco. He found me at a market and just, I think, enjoyed what he was hearing and saw this whole crowd bustling around me. And he came up and said, yo, yo, can I rap? And I was like, oh, man, as long as you're not terrible. Like, and he was like, no, no, I can. He's like, I'll do, I can do it. And I was like, okay, get, get up here. Yeah. And so he grabbed my mic and started. And that was the beginning of a long uh, collaboration with him. And the same thing happened for that guy you just met, Jamie, who is now my like technician but he's actually the saxophonist in the group yeah. he saw me at a busking thing and basically wrote to me on facebook and he just wrote i saw your show at such and such need sax question mark <laughs> and i was like yeah i need some sax come on he's like, pull in so it was this very organic uh, rootsy kind of busking way that i did it and because i didn't really have songs i just kind of had rhythms and ideas i didn't have a genre i didn't know what i was doing i'd never studied songwriting i had no musical training other than what i'd learned on youtube and so it was very um authentically my own yeah. original sound in a way and uh, and i kind of scaled up a few collaborators and then i started getting booked all of a sudden because people were loving what they saw at these markets and it wasn't long before i found myself like on small festival stages and that was when i had to start actually figuring out how to write songs yeah um and that was yeah that was a decade ago now it was 10 years ago and it's just been an absolutely wild ride and yeah a lot of live shows i really traded on the the live element of my yeah. career i mean i've seen some of your looping and i've watched some of the youtube videos like doing a bit of research for this and you're looping you're not just looping the guitar you're looping like whole like band sections and everything mm. that's that's like next level looping. I mean, I've, I've played with a loop pedal myself before and it's so easy just to go out of time, like instantly, you know, just a little tiny bit and the whole thing's screwed up, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they da- it's, a dangerous, it's a dangerous craft to be doing live. <laughs> yeah, so how do, you, how do you do that in mm. a live setting with a band, like looping the band and everything? That's exactly what Ed Sheeran asked me. Um, <laughs> When we, when we were hanging out, he, that was exactly what he wanted to know. He was like, how are you getting it right to integrate with the band? There are a couple of tricks to doing that, and there are ways to kind of lower the risk, and there are ways, ways to kind of like make the loop pedal the master and MIDI sync it with like your drummer's tempo and the some of the stuff that the drummer uses yeah. so that they kind of interact and like lock the tempos a little bit together. Um, there are also ways that you can kind of have just a click running like in your ear, which helps you potentially like make sure that your first, like if your, if your base layer is a solid loop, yeah. then everything that comes on top of that can be solid. Uh, if your first loop is all over the place, then you're really in a tough, tough joint. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's about trying to find creative ways to hack that a little bit and um not put yourself like you want to put yourself at enough risk that the crowd is like this is awesome he's taking all sorts of risks and not so much risk that like in the in the beginning when i started doing festivals i had a few of those where i was just taking way too much 
risk on yeah. stage and then a song would go out of sequence and then the next song would then i would get all anxious and nervous about how i'd screwed the one song up so my next song i would even your your timing would be more out because i was kind of sweating it yeah so um yeah over the years i found ways to find a couple of tricks and traps that you can you know make things a bit a bit safer for yourself while still taking some risks but yeah it's a it's definitely not for the faint-hearted as far as uh, stress levels no i mean i've i've been lucky enough to play a few places where i've just like played guitar and sung and that's stressful enough terrifying yeah. yeah there's nothing it that's i think that if you know if there was a tie-in with surfing in that sense it's like tackling the fear i remember i wasn't one of the bravest surfers from where i grew up but but that's i, I would say i'm still braver than most surfers but that's just because south africa has some gnarly waves where i grew up and so we have like sharks and sharks yeah so exactly so i remember being, i mean i quit surfing for two years from 12 to 14 because air jaws um, i don't know if you ever saw air jaws no you should you shouldn't watch it strictly all your listeners listening to this do not go watch air jaws <laughs> uh it's it's a documentary that nat geo ended up kind of running uh made by a guy called chris fellows who grew up right where i live yeah. um and he documented the first great whites breaching out the water catching seals so i'm sure you've seen those like videos of sharks like bombing up out of the water and grabbing seals in midair and like basically like bullets out the out the water um that whole style of hunting had never been captured people had no idea great whites did that because you just didn't see it Uh, and this guy found a way to like tow seals behind a boat like a fake seal and trigger sharks to do this method of like you know, jumping out the water and then he filmed it in slow-mo. Yeah. And so before the whole series came out on Nat Geo and you could watch Air Jaws and there was Air Jaws 2 as well, like full hour-long series of all about great whites hunting and how they tracked. It started in South Africa and then uh, they found that uh, great whites down in Australia were doing the same thing. Yeah. But that the great whites, I think like off the coast of America somewhere, wherever they are, great whites that side weren't doing this. So it was like certain areas were sh- causing them to like evolve in a way where they the seals were maybe getting too fast and yeah. too clever yeah anyways the point was before air jaws this guy came and did a slideshow in our little town of komiki where he presented some of his early pictures on like a overhead projector still and he was like this is what i've been finding and i remember i was like 12 years old and i was <laughs> in the audience and these pictures were being taken literally three kilometers from our surf break <laughs> and i i just threw in the towel i said to my friend i was like i'm done surfing for a while at the time i was competing in like western province champs which is our little like our surf league and i just threw it all in and it took me two years to get back in the water so yeah sharks were a real fear when you were younger but we don't have many attacks like uh, my actual beach i grew up surfing at long beach has never had a shark attack in all these years despite the fact that seal island is a couple of kilometers away so we we live pretty harmoniously with the sharks my fear was actually more about just big waves like we have big scary waves i've i've had friends we had a good friend of my my good friend of mine growing up his dad died at one of our surf breaks um being held under so that was the fear i had to overcome and i think that overcoming fear and tackling big waves as a youngster got me prepared in a way for getting onto big stages and tackling the fear and just knowing how to cope a bit yeah. better with a very raw feeling of fear and terror when you get on stage in front of a big crowd. Yeah. So like you said, hold downs then. What, can you remember what your worst hold down's been? Jeez, I've had some terrifying... We, we have that wave that I spoke about in the beginning called Dunes and it's, it's such a hollow beach break and it gets big it handles big swell and um it just comes out of nowhere it's coming from like deep atlantic swell and it just hits this like long it's a it's called um it's a long long beach i mean it's called long beach because it's a 10 kilometer long beach so you have to kind of you have to walk about 40 minutes from where i grew grew, my main break where we all live in komiki you walk like 40 minutes down the beach and there's no houses down there it's almost like nature reserve so you walk into the middle of nowhere and then you paddle out at this wave where it breaks on like shallow water and I've had some horrendous beat downs there, you know, like ones where it feels like your back just snapped and you kind of limp out of the water. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know what the, the, the longest hold down would be. I don't go and surf like dungeons, which is obviously our big, the big Red Bull, big wave venue uh, each year and sunsets. Both of those spots are right by where I live. And I surfed sunset once. I surfed Otacom once and 
that was basically me down. I never braved dungeons, but I mean, dungeons only breaks when it's like 30 feet or whatever. So it's yeah, not for it's, me. It's all right. You just leave that one over there. Let, yeah. let the uh, other stuff that. Yeah, dungeons <laughs> literally breaks in like the deepest water and it's right it's right by seal island it's i mean it's just a terrifying combination of things and it only breaks when the swell's massive it's just uh yeah, not for the faint-hearted no you're right give me two to three foot and clean any day and that's uh it's good enough that's good enough yeah, yeah. so you you like you predominantly shortboard then do you yeah 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 i mean i i've got a longboard i live uh i live now in a, uh, the town next door called musenberg and that's well known for having a very like popular longboarding wave oh yeah and we just had the duct tape event i don't know if you know duct tape it's like that well-known worldwide longboarding event and uh, made its way to our beach last weekend so the beach was alive with like longboarders everywhere from all over the world and so yeah i have like a big wooden log that a friend of mine's dad made for me and i do enjoy longboarding but yeah. it's shortboarding is my main my main thing for sure yeah yeah cool so like a couple of things i want to like sort of go back on is when you said you was like your first job sailing across the atlantic mm. like 50 59 days 56 days 56 yeah. days so if, did you encounter like storms and stuff out there in yeah time. yeah absolutely the first week leaving cape town uh you hug the coast of africa and you go up past basically you have to hug the coast because if you head out into the middle it's just too wild yeah so you hug the coast until you get up to namibia and then that's when you turn out into the like atlantic between you know yeah. africa and north uh north america yeah and um that week going up the coast uh, like towards Namibia was so rough and we hit so much bad weather that after two days of getting absolutely hammered the captain decided to turn around and we went back to port and spent a week waiting for the weather just to calm which yeah. was I remember that was when my mom was kind of phoning me and just being like are you sure you want to do this trip this sounds like a really <laughs> dangerous thing like why did you guys have to turn back and to be honest I was definitely second second guessing myself at that point after those first harrowing like few days and having to turn around just because the sea was too big and this is a captain that does this for a living he's a delivery captain all he does is take boats yeah. from cape town to the caribbean and back so like it, big waves were no i mean big seas was it was nothing he was worried about but so um anyways the first week was really harrowing then when you get out into the the doldrums and like the trade winds you know like heading towards the equator it gets really calm it's yeah. like just light winds at your back every day the trade winds blow the same way so they're be, they're with you and you have your spinnaker out you know the big front sail and you just potter along slowly yeah. and it's beautiful and you fish off the back and you know try and catch fish and there's really not much to do other than kick your feet up and read a book and so that was really like blissful for i would say the middle like 20 days um of just cruising across the and it's quite slow like there's never a lot of wind there in the trade winds it's always like light breezes behind you it seems but then when you get closer to the caribbean that's when that's why they call it hurricane season if you leave at a certain time of year which was when we left because then there are all these like squalls happening so you get uh interesting low pressures forming quite quickly and sporadically and you actually they're so dense and uh, that you see them on the sonar like when you're traveling just these dense patches of rain wind and like tropical thunderstorm but they're small you know and it's like what that uh, movie white squall was based around yeah it's like you can't really tell when they're going to form they pop up out of nowhere and you can have like a clear path and a clear sky in front of you and all of a sudden this like the weather just changes and it might only take you 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes to get through it. But if you don't have your sails down, the boat can get absolutely wrecked in yeah. those 20 minutes. We hit maybe three or four of those squalls along the way and thankfully had our sails in for each of them. But it was quite terrifying, you know, basically just having to go all systems go and immediately get sails down and just in the nick of time before the boat just gets horrifically yeah. annihilated by wind and rain. And that was quite exciting. Yeah. So and then you uh, and then you said your parents were from Switzerland and uh, Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Yes, yeah. so my dad was South African, my mum was Swiss. So did did they have an influence on music on you growing up? I think they did in the sense that I I had a deep appreciation for music because there was like music happening in the house. But need, no one in our family was particularly musical. Uh, my sister tried and failed to play the violin. She would love to hear me say that. <laughs> um, 
it was it wasn't pretty learning the violin is is not an easy thing to learn uh when you're a kid i think and she was one of those yeah anyways <laughs> but uh but no it, it was um i don't know what drew me to music in the end you know it was i just i also had like i have this really raspy kind of um croaky voice so the dylanesque voice i think always made me feel like i probably couldn't do much singing anyways even if i wanted to yeah um so yeah, I, for for many years I was just really had no idea. It was just when I got so obsessed with playing guitar that I started. It led me down that space where I started writing kind of songs, and then I still didn't really think I had anything going on until people started hearing the songs and then really responding so well to them. Um, people were freaking out when they were hearing like my early stuff, and I was like, I couldn't understand it. I could hardly believe it. I was like, Are you not bothered by how horrific my voice is? And no one. Was and I think what I didn't know then, which I know now because I've now spent years recording albums in studios, is that actually like producers and engineers recording people, um, they you know for them the best is when an artist has an interesting sounding voice yeah. because it gives the voice character and that's why you have like top line singers or people with amazing voices are often used rather as like backing harmonies and they're used to kind of fill out sounds and yeah. stuff, but they're not able to like be a proper lead vocal because their voice sounds so generic. You, yeah. you couldn't tell who they were. It doesn't have a character. So I didn't realize at the time, but obviously the, cro- the, the croaky vocal ended up being kind of a trademark thing. And as long as you can kind of sing in key, people actually seem to like it. But yeah, I, I don't know where it all came from. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I think that's what's really good about your music is it's not generic sounding. It doesn't sound like everything else out there and i and i i don't know if it's just myself thinking this but definitely as like being a surfer i can it's definitely got a very surfy feel about the whole the ocean's a massive part of your music Mm, yeah it comes up in a lot of my lyrics as well i can't i can't uh, avoid it yeah and i I don't if it's also not like a surf music uh specifically hey it's like i'm not it's i suppose like that more Donovan Frankenrider, Jack Johnson, those guys kind of trademarked what it, what surf music was supposed to kind of sound like in a yeah. weird way. Um, and I definitely, I was inspired by those guys in, in small ways, but that wasn't where I always, I saw my sound going. It wasn't what I was particularly interested in. So um, I liked a lot of the folkier stuff. And I also liked like hip hop music and rap music and all sorts of other stuff. So I kind of mashed a lot of things together. I'm a big like reggae fan. So yeah. my albums have this weird mix of like folk, rap, reggae. And it just makes them quite diverse, I think. But the the, the content and the themes and what I sing about maybe hits quite hard on the surf upbringing and the lifestyle. And even like now I'm on tour for three and a half weeks. And it's, when I go, then I have two and a half weeks off and I'm going to Mozambique to like yeah. this amazing surf break and that's how i motivate myself like while i'm on tour now it gives me a lot of energy knowing that as soon as i get home i go on a surf surf safari for like two weeks before coming back over for the big eight week tour yeah and i think i've always done that i always like litter surf trips in between my tours as like a a prize yeah and maybe that also like filters into the way i write songs when i'm on tour or something because i start like dreaming about being back in the ocean do you do melody first and then lyrics or lyrics first then melody or no, is it a mixture? We, it's a mixture for sure. Like I've had songs that I've written lyrics out because it's like a, something that I'm inspired to write. But nine times out of ten, I'm writing all sorts of rhythmic and melodic stuff first and just grabbing the guitar and making noise that I like until lyrics start to form. I, I find that way is a really pure way to do it because what what happens, especially if you go and I don't know if um, you've ever done this, where you you go back and you listen to something that you've you said you do, you play guitar and you sing. So like, you grab the guitar, you pick up, you find like a riff that you start liking, and and you just start like flowing a melody. Yeah. And what I find is like, one, then I'll like go and finally like if the song forms, I'll start to write lyrics for it. But what what happens is I go back and I listen to those voice notes, and you start to hear all the themes that the song ended up, like the lyrics that you ended up writing the song about, like all the beautiful hours that you put into like finding and crafting a a good lyric for a song. 
I find that all the essences are in the ramblings, yeah. like a lot of the words, specific like so, like ideas were kind of rambling out there already, uh, which is a weird cosmic thing for me, like the way that when you start to freestyle melody, a lot of the words actually find themselves without you having to consciously yeah. think about them. It's like a subconscious venting. Um, so that's the way I prefer writing. It's just with, yeah, like you said, melody first. Yeah. And then, so what about your new album that's just just been released now? Mm. How long did it take to write that? And was that written before the pandemic happened? It was half off. It was, so, I mean, I'd written most of the songs. We were actually like almost ready to pull the trigger and release this album just before lockdown happened. And then lockdown started looking like it was going to happen. And I was busy finishing off final songs and just trying to like decide what went on there. And then I just, yeah, there was no way we could release an album right. You know, we had no certainty about what was coming. And so we made the decision to hold the album back. And yeah, thank God we did because obviously what started as I think, you know, a couple of months of lockdown turned into a couple of years. And so we would have been in a lot of trouble if we had tried to release, you know, especially for me, because I'm a, I'm a first and foremost a live artist. Yeah. And so much of the energy that I cultivate with a crowd comes from my live performances. So uh, the idea of sending all these little, my new, like, song babies out into the world and not be able to support them with a live show was just didn't make sense. So, yeah, we held it back. And I had another two years to write more songs for the album, which is exactly what I did. We started releasing some of the songs from the album, like Mortal Man was the first one we released. And we started just dropping songs every couple of months. And I started writing and filling those gaps on the album with new songs, which ended up being a very painful process, like a long it was a long, the whole album essentially took four years because of the extra two years of lockdown. Yeah. So it was a long time to sit on all these new songs. But the nice thing was that I got to write new songs for it. And so a lot of my favorite songs were actually written during lockdown. Like there's at least on the album three or four songs that made it on, which were all written in the year leading up to the album's release. Yeah. And those replaced songs that, I don't know, maybe will still come down the line, but it, they just booted other songs off, so yeah, I blessing mean, and a curse. Yeah, no, I like I like I keep hearing the new uh, the new single "Better Together" on the radio. All the yeah, time. it's, it's like, been out there. Oh yeah, this is, and uh, it's one of those ones I first heard it. And I was like, oh, that's good. And then the more you hear it, the more it gets stuck in your head. So yeah, yeah thanks catchy, for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a typical catchy track. Yeah, um, earworm. Like some of the lyrics in in the album, some of them. Uh, uh, what's the one about growing older? You don't. Oh, you want to grow up, but you just grow older. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, that's that's a brilliant lyric. That is. It's like, and listening through the album, there's little bits that I've I've picked out, and there's like little lyrics in there that you're like, oh, they're just like, they're almost like you know you see those like um, Instagram or Facebook like things with little quotes on there's almost like you reckon there's some quotable there's, there's some all, quotable yeah, lyrics there's on there definitely some quotable lyrics on there well, that, that, I'll that take that. you can just uh you can just see being on one of those pictures or something but yeah it's it's really good so what what was your writing process like you said like some of those some of those songs went what are the ones that did go well i think what was changing for me is um like this is my third album now so your fir my first album, like I said in the beginning, like I was um, just learning to be an artist and I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I'd, I'd kind of, I'd ga gathered this kind of cult following, I suppose, in South Africa where we were selling out pretty big shows. We sold a 5,000 seat of venue out, which is our big, like um, kind of the Red Rocks of Cape Town in a yeah. way, if you know that venue in the States. Uh, we have one called Kirstenbosch. And we sold that venue out long before we had any radio support. And that was before my first album was out. Like I'd released like an EP. So I, I was really trading on like a live experience yeah. and a big collaborative, like involved thing. And I had to figure out for that first album how to make an album. And so I really didn't know. And it was a lot of like uh, winging it that went on with that first album. And I think that's why that it's trading change. It's got a lot of magic in it because like you can hear there's – it's an unevolved, like my songwriting was still immature in a sense, but uh, there was a lot of magic in it because of how I was just freewheeling through the process. My second album was like 
terrifying because I'd built a name for myself. We'd started touring around the world. We were getting, we were kind of building audiences all over uh, based on the first album and the the success of the live show in that first album. And your second album, I think, is like much more stressful because you yeah. have to figure out like how do you follow it up now and like what what should it sound like and how much do I push the boundaries with my sound and move towards other sonics that maybe interest me and how much do I want to stay true to my core and what is my core and who am I as a songwriter? There were a lot of like there was a lot of uh, yeah existential drama when it came to making my second album, but on this third album. Because my second album was well received and it, it kind of cemented my sound in a way, and it, I think in a, in a sense I got it right. Yeah. Like I, I didn't I didn't miss on that second album. I think if you miss on your second album, and then you your third album becomes about like going back to the drawing board, yeah. and a lot of artists will like maybe shift back to their original sound if they moved too far away or yeah. if they felt like they they lost it on their second their sophomore album. The third album becomes like, well, how do we fix that? But I didn't have that problem so it was a lot less stressful to make this third album uh, existentially I was just in a much better place and felt a lot more uh, mature in my songwriting like I'd learned a lot I've worked in all these studios around the world um, I've just been I've worked with so many new producers songwriters I got to work with Ed Sheeran on this trip obviously but I've got to also collaborate with acts like Ladysmith Black Mombazo who were heroes of mine growing up and producers from around the world like the guy from the lumineers you know simone felice i did a song with him and i'm a huge fan of those first two lumineers records so it was amazing working with him and being able to kind of handpick that i wanted to work with this guy and knowing that we had a enough influence to get us through the door and yeah. work with those guys that i had selected yeah and that was also cool because on my first records i didn't have access to those sorts of people so i was able to kind of go well I love the way that that guy produced those Lumine Lumineers records. And I think if I could like work my sound in with him, I could come up with something interesting. So this record, my process was more about finding the sorts of people I wanted to work with yeah. and being open to collaboration because on my first records, I was still just doing a lot of it myself and it was very DIY and that comes with its benefits, but I think it was quite uh, insular in a way. And yeah. I, this third record was more about me looking around and going, well, if I, if I can work with anyone I want now, um, who's it going to be? And then, yeah, not having the pressure, the existential drama that I felt with my second album of like, what's it going to be made me feel like, well, whatever it is, if it sounds good to me, I'm yeah. happy. And so you'll see on this third album, there's quite a lot of variety, like... It, yeah, there's not it a single sound. It's not that it, it doesn't sound like it's... I mean, I think the songs all live together really well. Yeah. Um, and you can listen from beginning to end and it'll it'll keep you there. And I was going to say, I like that about this album, that you can listen. It's like you've thought about the order the tracks are going in. Yeah, the, I literally took me... That was the big... The most difficult thing was the sequencing. I listened to it about... I must have written down about 30 different sequences. Oh, yeah. And then you have to listen to each of them and... and by try not to get sick of it all and try and put yourself in the listener's shoes and go like, how do I make sure that if someone presses play on that first song, they don't stop listening to it until it's done? Yeah. Like that's the goal. It does. It does that nice thing. If it, it slowly builds and then it, 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 it doesn't just like some albums, like you'll listen to an album and it build and build and build and build and build. And at the end of it, you're like sort of left like, yeah, <laughs> like where am I going? Yeah. But it does that. It builds and then it like, lets you down it gently. lets you down gently to yeah. leave you like, you know, as, as I said, like it's, the, it's the type of music. It, I, I say surf music because it's probably is because of sort of that, you know, Jack Johnson, Donovan Franklin writer, Ben Howard sort of thing. But it's very like, you can just, on your way to a surf or on the way back to the surf, you can just listen to, listen to your album and have it go in in the car or, you know, when you're like hanging with your friends and you can have it on and it do, it doesn't take over everything that's there, but sure. it's still got enough to catch your attention as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a really good job on the album and it's, it's, really, it's really well done. I really like yeah, it. That, I like how you said that it lets you down at the end because uh, I had to do two things which really broke my heart, which was uh, there are two songs that are right towards the end. Well, there's a few. There's like, um, but Chasing Grace, the song that went right at the very end, uh, was one of my favorite offerings. Um, you know, it's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. Yeah. And um, 
I really wanted to, I'm well aware that like positioning on, a, on an album matters. So like the further up you put the song, the more people will listen to it. Um, just because people don't all make it to the end of the album and we're living in like the streaming world nowadays. So shuffle, you know, people <laughs> shuffle it, yeah. around, but also like, yeah, when people like get the album, they'll listen down the track list and they'll get distracted somewhere along the line and they'll come back to it. But maybe that what they do is they, maybe they listen to the first five songs and then they get distracted and then they're like, they come back to it and they start at number one again. That's like yeah. the way it normally works. They don't pick up and go, Oh, where did I finish? I finished yeah. at number five. I'm going to start with track six and listen to the other ones. They just start at number one. Then they start getting a little bit like they find a favorite there and then yeah. they come back and just start playing number three the whole time yeah. and in the whole process number 12 is like never been played by them even though that for me was one of my favorite songs but for the people that do listen to the whole album like yourself the that last closing song which i think i put at number 13 is such a nice way for the album to end it was yeah. like the ultimate way for the album to end it absolutely brings you down the lyrics are thoughtful and um kind of wrap the whole message up in a really beautiful way and it was funny because i wrote that song and i knew it from the moment i wrote it i was like that's the album closer yeah and i knew in that same moment that i was signing a death wish on that song in a way <laughs> where it's like that's one of my favorite songs and it will get heard less and the fact that it gets heard less just because of where it is in the album means the algorithm won't be as kind to it yeah. on spotify and itunes and because of the algorithm won't be kind it probably won't do what it should it could do elsewhere yeah but for everyone who listens to the album they'll have that feeling where they won't be left feeling yeah. any sort of angst they'll the album will like wrap it up nicely and that was so yeah i i'm still that i'm still the album guy like i i want to hear yeah. pieces of work in totality and i'd prefer to just know that i can come back and that i i structured the whole thing right yeah rather than worrying does no, it get I'm, the most so, spins i'm guilty of doing exactly what you said i'll Sometimes I listen to an album straight through, but it's like that thing if you know listening to it to like track six and do something to it again, and then like two years down the line, you discover this track on the end of the album. You're like, oh man, this is the best track yeah. of the album. How did I miss this thing? Yeah, but yeah. It's like you know, start reading the book, you wouldn't put the book down halfway through and then start at the beginning again and just read to there. It's it's a bit mad why people do that with music. Um, so where's where's the tour going now then, and where are you off to around the world? Yeah, this is, so I arrived yesterday. This is the beginning of the whole new album push, I suppose. The album was released two days ago. Um, so finally uh, in the world and off my, off my plate. And now I go and start playing these songs for people. So I think tonight we start with our first show here in Bristol. Tomorrow we're in Nottingham, London the next day. Then we fly to Sardinia uh, off the coast of Italy for a show there with the band. The band all fly in and join me there because these first shows are just storyteller sessions, like smaller uh, smaller shows. And then we do hit some German festivals. We hit festivals. I think there's an Austrian festival, a Swiss festival, and a London festival. I don't, I don't really know. My strategy a lot of the time with this is to not know what I've got. My thing is like yeah. survive, stay healthy eat well yeah. and uh, try and keep my head straight because it gets so intense on these long runs. And so, yeah, it's, it's festivals now for the next month, basically, across Europe. And I'm not exactly sure when and where, but I'll be doing festivals. Then I go home for a three-week break where I'm going to Mozambique on a surf trip. And then I go, that's when we fly back and we start the big September, October, eight weeks, 35 cities, uh, yeah, lots of shows, big tour bus, 15, pe 15 people living in a tour bus together. And it just becomes like a traveling, yeah, a traveling circus for, yeah. for two months. And then, yeah, that takes me all the way to the end of October. I think our last show on that big run is the Hammersmith Apollo. Yeah. So if we're ending strong in London at one of the big kind of well-known venues. And um, yeah, we'll be playing. I think some of the biggest shows on that tour are in Germany, uh, in the big cities there, we have lots of beautiful big venues booked and we have a strong following in Germany. I love playing there, so we'll be doing that. We've got shows in Scotland, which are sold out already in Ireland, so we've got like st quite a lot of strength up up yeah. that side of the world. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that tour takes us everywhere, all over Europe. And then we go back to South Africa in uh, November, December for the summertime festivals back home. Yeah. And then hopefully next year early, we'll start heading over to Australia, New Zealand for the end of their summer. And then over to the States for West Coast, East Coast, stateside madness. 
Um, you actually live in the endless summer at the moment. <laughs> yeah, we do. That's yeah. I mean, and I took two years off it, which was nice. I got to. I was saying to my girlfriend, um, I was like, it's so weird for me to have experienced. I forgot what uh, winter time in South Africa was, felt yeah. like. Like it rains. Like we have rain in Cape Town. Like I just <laughs> didn't know. Like I just wherever I go, I'm like, oh man, Cape Town's the best place in the world, best weather ever. I just think that because we have never experienced a winter in 10 years. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, we chase the summers, which is a nice perk of, of the job. Yeah, it's got to be. And um, a, cu- a couple of questions that we normally ask is, can you remember on the surfing side, your best wave you've ever caught? Is that something you can remember? Hmm. I think what what happens because I'm still surfing quite a lot um, is it just gets replaced by yeah the last wave yeah the last one that I can remember yeah that's last. a very common answer that is oh really yeah but it gets replaced yeah. by the the last wave was your best wave the last wave that really got you stoked <laughs> yeah yeah I had a wave um, maybe six or seven weeks ago at a, a secret spot that I can't name uh, down in the Cape Point Nature Reserve, which is, uh, like I was saying, right there at the tip of South Africa. And it's one of the few sp- spaces that you can go and surf. And uh, it's not easy to find those waves. You have yeah. to really know where you're going. And But if we, when you grow up in the area, you obviously do know them. And there's a wave in particular that works only on very like specific circumstances. And most people don't know what those are. Yeah. And it's difficult to track. And you can fall you know like which feels completely almost dreamlike in this day and age where surfing has become such such a popular sport uh you can still go there on any day that it's working and maybe be in the water with like maximum two other people that also know about it and um it but it dredges it it comes out of again like deep deep uh, Atlantic Ocean water and you have to make sure the swell direction is just right and then it just hits this this reef and it's surrounded by kelp um, so you almost are like sitting in a yeah in a whole you're just sitting in a massive kelp bed yeah. and if it wasn't for the kelp the wave would just be out of control the kelp like slows down this big rolling um, kind of this like big rough water and it actually like smooths it out and then it hits this little ledge and if you're sitting just in the right place it just bottoms out and gets so hollow and so you kind of have to backdoor it and it also only breaks when it's a bit bigger and i'm kind of scared of that wave in particular um i go there with some friends who charge a lot harder than me and i'm always like a little bit weary because i know that they'll they'll be just fine like they froth for it they want it to be big yeah and i'm always like i hope it's a bit smaller today yeah and on that day we went it was one of the bigger days you know it was like not huge it was maybe four to six feet but that's more than big enough for me at a at a wave that heavy and uh so i was pretty pretty scared like when i got there i was like oh man it's on the bigger side today it's going to be it's going to be heavy out there and i managed to bag it was literally my first wave and I was the only one there. Everyone had just caught a wave and then and they were paddling back out. There were like four of us in the water and the set came through and I was the only one there. And you get that like lump in your throat where you're like, oh man, <laughs> there's nowhere to hide, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I managed to, yeah, I managed to nail the, the, the takeoff, which is kind of like I said, it's like a roll in backdoor situation and you, you have one big bottom turn before that thing starts to throw up ahead and I managed to just sneak under the lip and I got absolutely shacked and came flying out into like this big carve right like on all my friends like I was like ha! <laughs> and it was so nice because I'm I've de- I think this is probably the other like truism of surf culture is like your best waves are never seen by no. anyone no. it's like everyone sees you cooking out yeah. like and we all cook out like from you know um and I feel like that's been the story of my life. Like all my friends have seen all my worst waves yeah. and never my best waves. Yeah. And this was one of those rare incidences where everyone saw me get like backdoor shacked on this solid set at this like unknown wave. And then I just got to like pull a big carve run in front of their faces. And yeah, it was nice to get like props for that. That was definitely one of my favorite waves lately. And then I paddled out a few days later at like, it was maybe even a week later at our normal surf lineup. And like, Two people came and said, oh, we heard about your wave yeah. the other day. <laughs> and no, there was a nice feeling. It was nice, a feeling that it? I never had. I was like, it's never happened to me that people are talking about a wave that I had. No, no, one's, so, no one ever sees the good ones. So, no. yeah. yeah, that was yeah. it. Yeah. And then, okay, so like final question would be, 
if you had to choose then, I think this might be quite an easy uh, question, but night in a nice hotel like this, night in a tour bus, or a night in a van at a beach location? No, stop it. No, I mean, you're, you're, you're hanging out at a beach location all day, but uh, I would say I'd choose a tour bus over the hotel. Yeah? Yeah, we... Um, the, the tour bus is actually a lovely place. Like, staying in hotels um, is is quite disjointed because what happens is you like play the show like tonight we'll play our show and then you pack up late you have to like get everything to the hotel depending on the hotel's security you normally want to bring like all your expensive very important gear like the last thing you can do is have your gear get stolen yes. uh, while you when you're on tour um, that would be a real show stopper so you have to like lug gear into the hotel and then in the morning you all like have breakfast at the hotel and then you pack the van and you leave for the next place and that extra unpacking and packing becomes quite a problematic thing and with the tour bus the cool thing is you basically like just load the the bus up um it's got a big trailer on the back and then the the bus will leave from the city that night still and so you travel into the night and it chugs along and it kind of rocks you to sleep and there's like a lounge and everyone has a couple of drinks after the show and it allows you to kind of wind down where what happens at a hotel is everyone goes back to their rooms and you kind of have to wind down on your own you know so um it's nice to like wind down with the band after a show and play some playstation everyone like beats each other up on mortal Kombat for a while or something <laughs> yeah and then you can just like drift off to a room whenever you want and the the, yeah, the the kind of ship sails into the night and somewhere at like four five six in the morning the the, the bus will stop and then at like eight o'clock nine o'clock when you wake up the you're in a new city yeah and you can just get out and spend the whole day until sound check at like three or four you can experience the new city, you can go for a run, you can go to gym, you can see the sights. Yeah. And I really enjoy that. Whereas if you wake up at, a, at the hotel, you have to pack the van and then you have to drive the whole day. And you normally arrive just in time for yeah. the next one. So yeah. we all, uh, we really look forward to the tour bus trips because it just makes, gives you more time in a way. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me and mm, best pleasure. of luck lovely. with the new album. And uh, where can everybody find you on socials? Yeah, just Jeremy Loops. It's one word. Uh, it's easy to find. And I think it's just Jeremy Loops on all the different platforms. So wherever you are hanging out, you'll find me on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever you want, YouTube. And um, the new album's out everywhere as well. So you can go and listen to it on, on iTunes or Spotify or Deezer or Amazon. I don't know. Whatever you want. It's all. It's everywhere. It's called Heard You Got Love. And yeah, it took me four years to make this thing. It's a, a work of love. So... If you've got time and you feel like it, uh, give it a spin. And otherwise, have a look uh, out for the shows. We've got loads of shows coming up across Europe over the next couple of months, uh, many of which I think will be in and around the UK. Yep. And if nothing else, come to the Apollo show. The Hammersmith Apollo is going to be our big, yeah, the big finale in a yeah. way. So um, all, the sh- all the stops will come out for that one. And I look forward to uh, yeah, meeting lots of new people there. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks for that, Jeremy. What a life, eh? What a life. And didn't even know about music until early 20s, and he's just been flying. If you go listen to some of his stuff, it's absolutely incredible. And as he said, his new album, You Got Love's out now, and the new single, Better Together, keeps being played on the radio. And as I said in that, it's one of those ones I heard it the first time, and I was like, oh, yeah, I quite like that. And then the next time I heard it, and then the next time it just starts sticking your head, so it's one of those. But, yeah, fantastic surfer. And then um, the Thursday after I interviewed him, he was at the Wave for the day. I think he did about five sessions in a day as well. So tells you, you know, he's a pretty hardcore surfer. And um, some of the photos from that look really good, so go and check them out. Check him out on Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, all of those. Nice bit of music and also some really good catchy songs in there. Yeah, so if you've seen on social media, if you follow us on social media, you'd have seen about Leighton's Little Girl. That's why Leighton hasn't been on the podcast recently, Um, and he's been taking some time off. He's had some health concerns with his little girl, and recently she's been diagnosed with a tumour in her spine. So they're down in Southampton at the moment, and they've been down there for... I think about a week or two now while she's having tests done they've done an operation and he sent me a photo of the scar yesterday which is bloody horrific um 
and they've taken a biopsy. So it's just a case now of waiting for the results. We have set up a GoFundMe. Well, Pete Spoons, who's been on the show, set up the GoFundMe. And we've all been sharing that. And, um, and yeah, you can donate to that by heading across to our website. And I'll put the link on this episode to that. Or you can go to our Instagram or any social medias and hit our link tree. And the GoFundMe link is on there. Uh, we set up a GoFundMe because both of them are working parents. And obviously, they've had to take time off work. And at the moment, when I spoke to Leighton the other day, at the moment, it's costing him over £100 a day to be there in fuel costs, parking, which is £15 to park in an NHS car park for the day. It's bloody ridiculous, if you ask me. But yeah, so that's what's going on at the moment. That's why Leighton hasn't been on the show as much. And uh, we wish them all well and hope and pray for a speedy recovery and the best possible outcome so yeah mitch has offered to sit in as much as possible and also chris from logfinco and alan from adrenaline athlete and then i may do some more on my own if you guys like it i will if you don't tell me and i won't i'll do them with someone else but yeah so that's pretty much what's what's going on at the moment and uh we'll keep you all up to date and then if you follow us on social media and the gofundme page You'll get updates on there as well of everything that's going on. Thanks again to Jeremy for taking the time to sit with me for an hour and talk surfing, talk music. Really nice chap, really interesting guy. I feel like there was stories upon stories you could have just carried on with, you know, in in that chat. Yeah, thanks for listening. And on next episode is myself, Mitch, Alan and Logan Nickel. We all sat down at the wave and... uh, had a chat on the day of the adaptive surf competition which by the way that was pretty awesome as well it was a great day that was so yeah see you next time cheers